so what I'm going to talk about today is not our consensus protocol itself, but the underlying building block or the proofs of space-time. Okay. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about today is the underlying building block of our consensus protocol, which are proofs of space-time. So let's start with a little bit of motivation. And uh, the motivation is actually consensus. And we know that consensus is hard, right? It's a problem that's been studied a long time. It's still studied today. And the main challenge here is that you don't know who to trust. So some people may be malicious. You don't know who they are. And not only that, we know that Basically, permissionless consensus is impossible. We've known that since the 70s because you can't have consensus without an honest majority. So sort of the major new thing that uh, Nakamoto started with, uh, with Bitcoin was this sort of switch in the idea. Instead of counting resources to get, con uh, counting people to get consensus, let's try to count resources. So for this to work, we'll need the resource expenditure to be publicly verifiable. Everybody needs to be able to check that uh, people have expended resources. The resources should be limited. And now we can switch our assumption from there's an honest majority of participants to there's an honest majority of resources. Basically, the, the honest uh, majority controls a majority of the resources. So OK, this is the, the main theme. What are these publicly verifiable resources? What can we use to build consensus in this way? So uh, Satoshi Nakamoto had the, the first idea of using proofs of work. They're very simple. They're well known. They were known before Bitcoin. There's a problem with them, though, is that they're very environmentally expensive. Right? We've seen many talks uh, before me in, in this uh, conference about you know, how much electricity Bitcoin is, is uh, using, how expensive it is. Not so good idea. So another idea is to say, OK, we have another limited resource, which is uh, money. Right? The whole point of money, it's, it's uh, hard to get. We're trying to build a, a, a consensus protocol. Let's just use money directly. Um, unfortunately, for regular currencies like dollars, we don't have a good way uh, to do this publicly verifiable um, resource expenditure, at least not if we don't want to trust, say, a specific government or some centralized organization. So OK, we say, well, let's not use regular uh, money. Let's use cryptocurrencies. And that actually does sort of work. Um, and this is what we call proof of stake, right? We're basically have, we have this limited resource. That's the cryptocurrency. And we can prove that we've uh, used it in various ways. But proof of stake has its own problems. So for example, proof of stake usually uh, needs some kind of uh, strong non-standard assumption uh, to prevent various kinds of attacks. For example, we need to assume that honest parties can completely erase their memories, or uh, what usually is assumed is they can erase old keys, because otherwise we get into all sorts of strange problems. So th these are assumptions that are often like little asterisks when you look at the protocols how do they get their security? There's somewhere a little asterisk that says, yes, we assume that parties can change keys and erase their old ones, and no one will ever have access to them. But in real life, this is a very strong assumption, because erasing things securely is actually quite hard. And then there are some inherent vulnerabilities to proof of stake, such as uh, a network capture attack. So in proof of stake, basically, we have to trust that the majority of the stake is in good hands. But if this ever happens to be false, so suppose at the start of the system, somebody launches a 51% attack by just buying 51% of the stake. And they do it secretly. There's no way to know because it's sort of semi-anonymous. I can pretend to be many people buying. From then on, the network is captured. There's no way to uh, make sure that anybody else will ever have more than 49% because as long as they don't sell, that's it. They, they have 51% forever. So again, is this an actual attack? I don't know. Um, uh, but the point is, we don't know. And we won't be able to find out until somebody actually uses this 51% to launch an attack. So there are various problems. It's not to say that proof of stake can't work or doesn't work. But I wouldn't want you know, the whole world economy relying on this. OK, so that's the motivation. Let's talk about what the alternative uh, we're, we're suggesting is proof of space time. So I'm going to give 
uh, definition of what we mean by proof of space time. Of course, it's sort of going to be hand wavy. I'm not going to get into the technical details, but it'll give you sort of a general idea what we're trying to do. So what is the ideal thing? What would we, like if you know, we didn't have any technical uh, requirements, what would we try to do? Um, we want to show that you basically reserved a piece of your disk, your hard disk, for a unit of time. So this is why we call it space time. Right? You're storing something for a week. And if you think about it, this is actually the cost you pay. So if you buy, I don't know, storage from Amazon, right, you're not paying for a gigabyte. You're paying for a gigabyte for a month. So space time is actually the, the right unit to measure here. So this is what, what ideally we'd want to do. This is the, the limited resource now is your disk space or your disk space over time. And you want to be able to prove that you stored something. You basically made your disk inaccessible for anything else for that period of time. And how would we do it? Well, you need two phases. In a first phase, you're going to do some initialization. Um, why do we need initialization? Because we don't want a lot of communication. We don't want, uh, you would have to read this data from other people in the network. So we want you to be able to create the data yourself. You have a two terabyte disk. We don't want you to download two terabytes. You'll just run something to create, uh, fill your disk with two terabytes. And then we have an execution phase. So this init phase fills your disk with data. In our case, we don't have any requirements that the data be useful. So the data is going to be junk. It's just meant to prevent these kinds of uh, Sybil attacks. Um, but you filled your disk. And the second phase, the execution phase, this is something that repeats itself every once in a while. You're going to run it, say, once a week and prove that you're still storing this data. OK, this is what we'd like to do. Unfortunately, we can't actually get this, this exact definition. This is simply unattainable. And the reason is that if you have low communication, if we don't want to require you to actually uh, get data from uh, somewhere else or to send all your data to somewhere else, right? If, if everything is local in terms of like this huge mass of data, then there's always an alternative, right? So what you're doing here, we have an initialization phase where you start out with no data or very little data and you fill your disk. So why do you actually have to store anything? You can just store this little tiny bit, this initial random seed, and then when I ask you to prove that you're still storing it, you can just recreate the exact same data. So this means that I can't expect the, this original definition to actually be satisfied, because there's always an attacker that can just recreate the data whenever it needs to, without storing anything. So what do we actually get? What is our, our sort of slightly weaker definition that we can achieve? We prove that you do one of two things. One thing that you could do is store the data, right? So this example is, is a, a graph, right, where at each time period you're storing some amount of data and the sort of total space time is the area under the graph here, right? This is how much resource you expended. So that's one way of doing it. But the other thing you might have done, and we can't tell the difference, you might have not stored anything but just recreated the stored data. So instead of storing this entire thing, maybe you stored just the initial seed, and every time I asked you to prove something, you did some work and recreated the data. And this is what the proof of space time actually shows. I did one of these two things. OK, so one, one of the things I could possibly do here is just do proof of work all the time. So What's, why is this better than proof of work? Well, the reason it's better is that for rational users, we do actually get something nice. So the point is the cost of recreating this data is going to be high. And if we make sure that it's high enough, it's greater than the cost of just storing the data, then if you're rational, if you care about the cost, then you are going to choose option number one. So, you know, malicious adversaries could just do proof of work all the time, but rational adversaries will say, look, I, I could do proof of work, I could do storage, storage is cheaper, so I may as well do storage. So this is where we get the advantages over proof of work. And now our assumption needs to be slightly changed, right? So we can't just assume that there's an honest majority of storage because we said the adversary could do just proof of work. So our assumption is now that this combination of storage and work is 
controlled by, uh, a majority is controlled by honest parties. But again, this is you know, another, a reasonable assumption. I think you can believe this just as well as you can believe that there's an honest majority of storage or that there's an honest majority of work. It's the, the same flavor of, of assumption. Okay, so what do we actually get? What, what do we get in these uh, proofs of uh, space-time? Well, first of all, we have a very, very simple uh, proof of space-time or post-construction. And it's simple and it al it's also provably secure, uh, by provably secure in the ra random oracle model, but you know, this is true for basically any of the blockchain protocols we have today, so I don't think this is uh, saying too much. Another thing that we have and then I'll talk about a little bit more uh, today, is we have um, an adjustable initialization difficulty. So we can change the, the difficulty of this initialization phase sort of independently of anything else. So we can make it harder to initialize without changing the other parameters. And we'll see why that's important. Um, we also get some, a way to do this incrementally that I won't talk about, but uh, this is a nice feature of our construction. And finally, there, we have, so okay, we said we can change it. I'll talk about why we need to change it. Um, but then, what should the value be? How difficult should it be? This is something that's sort of hard to determine a priori, and one nice thing that we have, and this is basically independent of our specific construction. It's a generic mechanism to get this uh, market signaling for how much, how, how, uh, much should initialization cost. And of course, all of these things are part, <coughs> our, our post-construction is, is uh, our basic building block for the space mesh consensus protocol, which I'm not going to talk about today, uh, but you're welcome to go online and uh, download the paper if you want to see you know, how this fits in. Okay, so before I get into the actual construction, I want to talk a little bit about comparison. So you may have, uh, you know, if you're in this space, you've heard of various uh, related things that sound almost the same and it's a bit confusing. So I want to sort of, you know, straighten out what's the difference. So there's, we have proofs of space time. There are also proofs of space. Um, so what, what are the two? Why are they different? So uh, one thing that's different I, well, maybe before I say what's uh, different, something that is the same is basically what they're trying to do is the same. In proofs of, of space, we don't have uh, this initialization cost explicit, but actually they, uh, they need the same resource. So we, we're talking about something that's trying to do the same thing. Um, in terms of the difference, so our construction, our specific uh, post-construction is very simple. Most of the proof of space constructions uh, are based on something called graph pebbling, and those are pretty complex. Just even describing them is, is pretty complex. Programming them is more complex. There are some newer ones that are not based on graph pebbling. They're also more complex than our constructions. Secondly, our construction, uh, to the best of my knowledge, is the only one that has an adjustable init difficulty, and we'll see why that's important. Um, the other constructions, you can adjust the initialization difficulty, but to do that, you also have to make the verification correspondingly more expensive. So that's a pretty big cost, and uh, this is something that we can get around. Uh, on the other hand, it's not that you know, we're strictly better in every way. One drawback of our construction is that our prover runs in linear time. So you actually, in order to prove that you stored uh, two terabytes, you will actually have to read two terabytes of data. So it doesn't sound like a horrible thing if you're doing it once every two weeks. If you're trying to use it every five minutes, that's not such a good thing. And uh, the proof of space constructions actually have a much better uh, proof complexity. So in both cases, the verification complexity is very cheap, but in the proof of space, you can prove in polylog time rather than uh, reading the whole thing. Okay, so that was proofs of space-time versus proofs of space. What about memory-hard functions? They also sound sort of similar. They're like we have, we have to use a lot of memory and we're also using a lot of storage. What exactly is the difference here? So here there's actually a, a big definitional difference, right? What we're trying to achieve with both is different. So with proofs of space-time, we're trying to say between the two proof computations, right, between my first proof and the next proof in uh, two weeks, uh, 
I've stored a lot of data. In a memory hard function, I want to say computing the results of this function requires a lot of accessible memory while I'm doing the computation. So these are very uh, different and they're incomparable in terms of strength. So for example, uh, proof of space time might be computed with very little memory. In fact, it's good for it to be computed with very little memory. So while I'm actually proving, I do have to maybe read the entire uh, disk space, but I never have to put the whole thing in memory. I do it just sequentially. Uh, whereas with a, a memory hard function, right, maybe I need to use a huge amount of memory to give the answer, but if I'm giving you like two answers, once today and once in two weeks, I can reuse the same memory. Maybe I can even run you know, multiple different proofs for different results together and sort of reuse the same memory while I'm doing this. And the, the proof of uh, the memory hard function doesn't prevent that. So they're used for very, very different things. Okay, so now let's get to the construction. How do we actually build our proof of space time? So what's the high level idea? What we're going to use as our data is actually going to be a table composed of proofs of work. So each cell in this table, think of it as a proof of work. It's the same as we use, say, for Bitcoin or for Ethereum. Now, this gives us very fine grain control over the initialization cost. Because we can, proofs of work have this property that we can change the difficulty, basically in very small increments, we can say exactly how hard each of these cells is to fill. And so we can easily say how much work you need to do to fill the table. And it's also very easy to verify a single table entry. Right? We can just ask you to give me the proof of work, and the proof of work is easy to verify. That's the whole point of a proof of work. So that's great. Um, what do we do in the execution phase? Well, I want to show that I'm still storing this data, right? I filled this data two weeks ago. I have this table of proofs of work. How do I prove to you that I still have this, this table right now? So something that like, seems to come naturally is, why don't you ask me a random place in the table and I'll give you the answer, right? And if I didn't store a lot of the table, then I shouldn't be able to give you the answer. So you know, you'll catch me if, if I'm not actually storing it. So this is the high level idea, but it doesn't quite work. What breaks down? The problem is that if I uh, can reconstruct this table myself, and this is the whole point, right? This is a table of proofs of work. Each table cell is not a lot of work. So I can just not store anything. I wait until you query a cell, and then I reconstruct just that cell and give you the answer. So now, it doesn't matter, you ask me a small number of, of positions because if you ask me for a lot, it means a lot of communication and we don't want that. So I, I need to do a little bit of work and I always get the right answer. And I didn't store anything. So this is not a good proof of space the way we described it now. Um, but actually our construction is not much more complex than that. So the initialization is exactly the same. We take a table, fill it with uh, proofs of work. The execution, there's actually just one more step. What happens is the verifier is going to send a random challenge. So before the verifier sent a random challenge that was one of the cells of the table and I answered what was in that cell. Now we're going to take a few more steps. So the verifier is going to send a random challenge and I'm going to use this random challenge to commit to the entire table. How do I commit to the table? I build a Merkle tree, whoa, sorry. I build a Merkle tree. Okay, so I, I take all the cells of the table, I use them as the leaves of a Merkle tree, and I send you the root of the Merkle tree. So this is a commitment to the table. And now we just do what we did before. The verifier queries a random cell. Of course, we'll have to repeat this several times. So the verifier will actually query multiple random cells. And now I give you the contents of the cell, so you can check the proof of work. But I also give you the Merkle path, the proof that this was actually the, in the table that I committed to. And then I can check the Merkle path, this is also a standard thing, and that's it. If everything uh, checks out, I accept your proof. So this is it, this is the whole construction. Um, there is something that's a bit subtle here, which is I don't commit when I initialize. So somehow 
the natural thing to think of would be I'm, you know, in the initialization phase, I create the table, I commit to the entire table, and now every time you ask me for something, I give you a table cell and prove that uh, I've committed to whatever was my, in my original commitment. But this actually doesn't work. This is, it doesn't work for the same reason that the original thing didn't work, right? Because I can reconstruct just the cells of the table that I need. So it, it's, you know, the attack is a little weaker here, but it's still an attack. And even if I committed to the table, I can still uh, do the same type of thing. What I do instead is I commit every time I uh, prove that I'm storing the data. So this is what requires us to actually do this sequential read over the table for every execution phase. Okay, so let, let's do a very like a high level analysis. Why does this uh, work? Why, why is it secure? Well, the idea is suppose I don't store the entire table, right? So I, I've you know, stored even most of the table. There are some entries that I haven't stored. So now you give me a challenge and I have to commit. I have to basically say in advance which cells I'm going to reconstruct and which I'm not. So the cells that I did not reconstruct, I'm now committed to. So we can call them bad cells. And the point is, because I'm committed now, if I don't have the entire table before I get your query, then you will catch me, again, it depends on the fraction of the table that I'm not storing, but if, say, I didn't store you know, half the table, then with probability half, for each query, you didn't catch me. Uh, sorry, you will catch me, right? And you know, we query enough times, if we query 10 times, the probability that, uh, that I don't get caught if I didn't store half the table is like one in a thousand, and this goes down exponentially. So this is basically the reason why it works. And the idea here is, in terms of cost, I have to either store a cell or recreate the cell before the commitment. Those are basically my only two choices. And therefore, I have to spend space time. Again, I get the choice whether I'm storing or reconstructing, but those are the only two options. I have to do one of them. I can't just not spend anything. Okay, there are some subtleties. Um, so what I described right now, we said we just use any proof of work. That's not quite true. Um, the reason is that you might be able to take multiple proofs of work and somehow compress many results into a smaller space. So you'll still do the work, but maybe you don't need as much space to store them as the proof of work tells you to. Um, so this doesn't violate the proof of work security, right? Because you're still doing the work. So what we need is something that we call incompressible proofs of work, right? Something where you're guaranteed that if you have you know, 100 proofs of work, then you actually need to use 100 times the space to store them all. Um, and this is true, so again, the, the, like the regular compression type arguments we can use information to say that you, know, you have a lot of information there because it's a random string, and this prevents you from compressing. But even here, it gets a little bit more subtle because we do have this random oracle that has this huge amount of information, and everyone has access to it. So we need to, to be a little bit more careful when we prove that this works. But luckily, the actual the standard hash proof does work. So if we just store the nonce, then, or actually there's like a small portion of the nonce, then we can show that this is incompressible. So the, the Bitcoin uh, proof of work actually is basically good enough. OK, so we have a, a construction. And we've seen what it does. And I told you that one of our properties that we have is this change in initialization cost. So why does it matter? Why, why do we want to change the initialization cost? So remember that what we promised is that this is not just a proof of space time, it's a rational proof of storage. That rational users prefer to store data rather than do the work. But this is only true as long as the cost of initialization is more than the cost of storage. Right? Once the cost of initialization becomes too low, then adversaries will just prefer to do the initialization, rational adversaries. right? They will do the initialization again and again rather than store the data. And the thing is, when we start the system, so maybe now we know the exact cost of storage, the exact cost of work, and I can set the parameters so that it actually is true that the cost of initialization is much higher than the cost of storage. But things change over time, right? So if we're using this as a basis for a cryptocurrency, 
It's going to keep running for many years. It's not reasonable to assume that the costs of storage and, and the costs of work are going to remain exactly the same, or even the same relative to each other. Right? So for example, the initialization cost is dominated by proof of work. If somebody creates a new ASIC, or somebody, uh, you know, just Intel comes out with a new computer or AMD and prices go down, right, the initialization cost can go down. On the other hand, storage costs might increase. So maybe, you know, the price of work stays the same, but there's flooding in Thailand and, you know, the hard disks suddenly become a lot more expensive. And again, what we care about is the relative cost. So if suddenly the storage gets very expensive, then maybe initialization suddenly is relatively cheaper compared to storage. There are also things like opportunity costs, right? So some other proof of uh, space network is suddenly offering money for uh, storage, so we have to offer more. Um, and the final thing, and this is maybe the, like, the, the most critical for space mesh, is how long you how long you, you have between these uh, proofs, these execution phases. So if we're waiting one week, then your space time is one week times one terabyte. But say they're now double the number of miners. So maybe now you have to wait two weeks between each execution proof. So the storage costs the same per gigabyte per week, but now you're spending two weeks. So it's twice the space time cost and the initialization cost did not change, right? So if you want to be able to spend longer periods of time between proofs and you don't know in advance exactly how long it's going to be, this will also require you to change the initialization difficulty. So how do we set this difficulty? As I said, in the beginning when we launch, we can say, okay, we, we have, you know, we, we checked how much Amazon is, is uh, charging for storage, how much it costs to run our proof of work, and we have an idea, we can set the, the parameters conservatively. But over time, they change. So how do we know what to do? So ideally, we'd want some market-based mechanism, something similar to what Bitcoin does, um, or Ethereum, to, to change the proof of work difficulty, right? Although they do it for different reasons, but this is something that's sort of an automatic part of the protocol. I don't need an external oracle to tell me what the actual real-world prices are. And oracles are really problematic if you want a trustless system. So we want something that's market-based. So what are we going to do? We're going to have miners basically tell us when they prefer work. Um, but of course, we can't just say, you know, tell us when you prefer work because this is very gameable, right? Miners might just lie. So we're going to incentivize them to tell the truth. How do we do that? We let them prove that they're actually using work rather than storage. And then we just give them a little bit extra reward. So if you think of this in the context of a cryptocurrency, right, every time you use a resource, then you're going to be eventually rewarded for it. Just like we do in you know, all the existing cryptocurrencies, right? If you're using proof of work, you get a block with a reward. Or if you're using proof of stake, again, whenever you generate a block, you get a reward, and your reward should be proportional to the amount of resource you expended. So now we're saying, with this reward, we're going to give a little bit of a bonus, some epsilon bonus, where if you prove that you did work instead of storage, then you get more money. And so now we change the calculus for rational users. If the proof of work is almost as cheap as storage within epsilon, then I actually prefer to do work. So you can think, yeah, this is bad for the environment, but it's only going to happen for a short time until we change the difficulty again and everyone goes back to storage, so don't worry, the polar bears will still be happy. Um, so the idea is once we have this mechanism in place where rational miners will use work when the cost is close to or below the cost of storage, and otherwise they'll use storage, we can check, we have all these proofs that the miners are generating, and we can check uh, which ones have this extra signal, the, the extra reward for using work, and which ones don't. And so, for example, here, you can see in the beginning, everybody's using storage, and then at some point, the cost of work goes down or the cost of storage goes up. We don't know from this mechanism exactly what happened, but we know that the relative cost has changed, and now everybody here is using work. So just like we do in Bitcoin, right, like we can take every two weeks, say, and 
look at what the fraction of, of users are that are using work, and if it becomes too high, we say, okay, this is their signal for increasing the initialization difficulty until this fraction goes down again. Okay, so this is the, the basic idea. Um, how do we choose this proof of work? So it's not quite as trivial as uh, uh, we, we show now because the, the, if we just choose the naive solution of saying, well, okay, we'll just have a separate proof of work, right? If you're doing uh, storage, then you do the regular post, and otherwise we just use Bitcoin type proof of work. Um, this almost works, except you have a problem that the cost of this proof of work isn't very tightly bound to the cost of the actual initialization. And if the, the cost, say you're using a different hash function, right? Or you're, the hash function is doing something slightly different. If the cost of, of the real initialization um, is much higher than this alternate proof of work, then your rational analysis there doesn't work anymore, right? Honest, honest rational users might prefer to do the alternate proof of work even though the initialization is actually still more expensive than storage, just because the alternate proof of work is, more, is much cheaper than initialization. So we really want to have this like, tight connection between the alternate proof of work and the actual cost of initialization. So what is our solution? We're going to use the actual initialization as our alternate proof of work. But we can't just run the initialization again, because if you've, the whole point of the uh, proof of space-time is that if you've initialized once, you can make multiple proofs without doing a lot of work. So what we're going to do is let you run the initialization, but with a different identity. So again, I didn't get deep into the details of our construction, but this table that you generate, right, in order for you not to uh, be able to amortize your storage to basically have like multiple Sybil identities with one table, this table has seeded in it your identity. So you, your public key is an input to the proof of work that you use in the table. So every different identity requires a completely different table. And this is basically the, the reason this works, right? The proof of work cost is exactly the cost of the initialization because you are running initialization. And the storage is bound to the identity. So if you have already stored something, right, with your original identity, but now initialization costs become much lower and you'd rather do the work, it actually requires you to do the entire work all over again because a different identity requires a completely different table. And moreover, the way we choose the new identity, it's unpredictable. You can't, say, pick a time when work is cheap and run many of these uh, sort of proofs of work and then start using them sometime later to cheat, right? Because you get this challenge that you couldn't predict, the, cha the same challenge that you got for the proof of space time that you couldn't predict. So what this means is that we get the properties we want. Basically, it's not rational to use this alternative proof if the initialization cost is more expensive than storage, at least more, more expensive by epsilon. And it is rational to use it when initialization is approximately as cheap as storage. So we do get the signal that we want. Okay, so that was uh, basically the, the details. If you're interested you know, in the technical stuff, then there's a, a paper online on ePrint um, that explains in much greater detail exactly what happens, and of course, also the formal proofs of security. And there's also, on our uh, website, uh, the protocol paper for Space Mesh, for the Space Mesh Consensus Protocol, which uh, not only explains how we use this proof of space time as part of a secure consensus protocol, but also adds a bit to it. So one of the things that we need there is a non-interactive version of uh, proof of space time, and we actually combine a proof of sequential work with a proof of space time to get this non-interactive version. So you can read ag again about the details in this paper. And finally, these things uh, have been implemented in Go. You can uh, see the code online. It's all open source on GitHub. Thank you.
mentioned that the assurance that something is being recalculated rather than stored comes from the new ID. Yes. New ID can only be identified against an old ID, right? So That's I true. have to be using storage for a while for me to all of a sudden be able to use CPU. Yes. So if, if it's cheaper for me to calculate multiple times out of the bat, you don't have any ID which I'm consistent on, and then you cannot. So that's a good question. So again, we're using this only as a signal. So you know, if at Genesis you pick the parameters wrong, you might have this problem. But otherwise, you have old IDs that are always uh, uh, there. And so you can see out of the IDs that you already have, you can think of it as a sample of uh, who's there. And you'll see that they start using work instead. That makes sense. Thank you. So what stops someone from just storing the Merkle tree and then calculating each uh, piece or like each item of data at that point? Like you said you were using the Merkle root and Merkle yes. tree. So this, this is exactly what I said that you cannot create the Merkle tree in the initialization phase. So the Merkle tree itself, the hash you use has prefixed to it the challenge that you get in the execution phase. So it's a different Merkle tree every time. Okay, thank you.